What does it take to be brilliant? How do you stand out in a noisy world? Meet Simon Bailey. Simon is one of the most genuine and charismatic speakers and authors I've ever had the chance to meet. This man is on a mission to help bring out the very best in individuals and organizations, not to be good or great, but to be brilliant. He's a Hall of Fame speaker, a best-selling author, executive advisor, and entrepreneur, just to name a few of the hats that this gentleman wears. In the interview, we talk about how he discovered his passion for helping others, what it's like speaking on a stage in front of thousands of people and the top skills that are necessary for success in today's fast-paced world. Simon covers the big picture and then breaks it down step by step so that you know how to take action and get things done. I'm sure that you'll enjoy. So sit back and relax. Hello everyone, today I am extremely excited to welcome Simon Bailey to the show. He is the CEO of Simon T. Bailey International. It is an educational company that specializes in teaching people how to be brilliant in an average world. Simon is one of America's top 10 most booked corporate and association speakers on change, leadership, and customer experience, and he has impacted more than two million people throughout his presentations in over 45 countries worldwide. As a Hall of Fame keynote speaker, executive advisor, and author, he addresses more than 100,000 people each year. Simon is a top-selling author of seven books and his most recent, Shift Your Brilliance, we'll talk about in just a little bit. He, it's, he's got an incredible personal development program that takes individuals and organizations on a transformational journey to create a brilliant life in business. And thank you so much for joining us today, Simon. Hey, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. We are absolutely glad to have you. Now, if you don't mind in your own words, could you tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, I'm just a guy that grew up in Buffalo, New York, and mom and dad dropped me off at college. And at the end of my freshman year at college, they called and said, we don't have the money to send you back for your sophomore year nor do we have money to bring you back home to Buffalo, but we do love you. And uh, <laughs> I eventually did finish school. I was just on the 10-year plan. So now I, I tell people that if I can take 10 years to finish my degree, anybody can get a degree. But, but uh, my main purpose is to inspire individuals to be fearless and to create their future. That's what I do. Now, how did you discover this passion for really helping and, and helping people find that future? Yeah, so for me, I went to work for Disney and I was working at Disney a number of years ago and they sent me over to Paris to design a leadership program for a thousand leaders out of Barclays Bank out of London. And so I'm in Paris and Lion King had just come out and I said, remember who you are. You are more than what you have become. I literally had this Lion King moment. And I went back to my room that night in Paris, my hotel room, and I asked myself three questions. Question number one, what would I do if no one paid me to do it? Question number two, what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? And question number three, what makes me come alive? And that third question came out of a book I was reading at the time, written by John Elridge. And in his book, Wild at Heart, John says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive because what the world needs are people who come alive. And that day I decided I wanna speak, write, train, consult, and coach. So I came back from Paris to Florida, cashed in my entire 401k with significant Disney stock, took out a line of credit on the house, put, I put my resume out on the street, got four job offers, turned those all down, and gave myself about a year before I left Disney to go for it. That's how I found my passion. That is absolutely incredible. Now, do you think that your work within Disney being such a customer oriented and communication company had anything to do with you wanting to bring the brilliance out in others? Oh, absolutely. Because it's, I worked there for seven years and to hear the story of Walt arriving in California in 1923 with $40 to his name and then building Disneyland, but then traveling to Florida to buy land up through a series of dummy companies, and he did it with the power of imagination and grit, you start to believe that anything is possible. I love that. You know, it's interesting because we worked in the cruise industry, so in the tourism industry as well, and you just, I think there's certain aspects of working in a tourism or a customer-facing aspect where you have to learn to communicate effectively. You've gotta to learn to be that bright spot in someone's day because 
people just go on autopilot all the time. Totally. People just kind of give you the screensaver face and kind of zone out, right? But no, Disney just kind of got in my blood and it really gave me the boost to go for it. That's exciting. Now, what were some of the biggest setbacks or biggest hurdles that you overcome when you were starting your business? Well, starting my business, three hurdles. Number one, the hurdle of what if it doesn't succeed and I have to go crawling back to Disney to beg for my job, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the second hurdle, will I get a refer, return phone call that will do business with me, right? And then the third thing, will I be able to really grow and scale and build something that's viable? And I can absolutely say I've been doing this for 15 years and the answer is yes, you can. Very nice. Now what, you know, as you're starting out, one of the big things that we've talked about with people is you growing a network and building those connections. And so coming from this other arena and reaching out to try to coach people, how did you really start, you know, giving your value proposition and reaching out to those individuals and companies you wanted to work with? Well, I started going to various business networking events, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, in anything that had networking on it, and I went to it. I showed up, and I had one question. What was the problem that people were facing? Were they trying to increase their sales? Were they trying to attract and retain customers? Were they looking to uh, grow talent? So I just started asking questions, and I started listening. And then I said, okay, how can I be a solution to that problem? And start to build out the content that I had to be that solution and to charge for it. So that was, that was the first thing. The second thing is I became a student of many magazines, Fast Company, Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Fortune. And I started reading, looking for the trends, looking for the breakthrough ideas, looking to see what entrepreneurs were doing. So really became just a student of being an entrepreneur who wanted to provide a solution to a problem. And then the third thing is I decided to take some online classes from other thought leaders who really challenged me to be more productive, uh, helped me understand how to survive long term by not just being a thought leader, but writing a book, writing articles, coaching, doing training, so that I just didn't stay in the one area that I thought I was going to do, but I looked for all of the sub areas that supported that area that gave me credibility. And those are some of the activities that I did that got me focused and, and helped us get to this point. And how long would you say that sort of the learning aspect of what before you really got larger, you know, nobody goes from zero to a hundred thousand speaking people speaking to a hundred thousand people in a year. And so a lot of people get, you know, stuck in the mindset, well, I've done this for six or seven months and I just haven't made it yet. So can right. you a little bit of a time? I think honestly, it was about a three year grind, just three years of grinding every single day, stay in the course, getting better, letting go of what didn't work, acquiring a new skill set, being open to what was happening. So I'll give you an example. I met some folks at lynda.com years ago, and I had never heard of lynda.com. And everyone that was in my sphere of influence said, don't do it. And I just said, intuitively, I need to create a partnership with them and put some of my content online. Well, just because I said yes to that decision back in 2013, the one course that I created for them has now been viewed over 600,000 times by people in 100 countries. And I went back and did another course with them um, called Finding a Sponsor. So the first course was called Building Business Relationships. The second course was Finding a Sponsor. But my whole point is, in starting out, that didn't happen overnight. That was a, probably about a five to seven year relationship that all of a sudden when it happened, I had to be ready. So if I hadn't put in the three years of grinding it out, developing content when no one was reading it, when people were probably deleting it when it came in their inbox, but just staying the course, all of a sudden when the lynda.com opportunity presented itself, I could say yes, because I had, had done the work. That's it. And you knew that what you were giving that pat number one, your passion for what you were doing, yes. that yes. is obviously going to get you through that. And then you also knew that you had educated yourself. You had a great message to share with the world. And that really helped to carry you through those grinding it out times to when you really make it, you know? Yes, exactly. 
Gotcha. Now, do you have, what would you say or who would you say is your ideal client that you would get to work with? My ideal client actually falls in two buckets. The first client is an individual who is perhaps a professional anywhere from 25 years of age to maybe 35, maybe even 40. And they have been working professionally for five or more years. They are perhaps uh, have reached their first mid management role and they want to get better. They want to move up in the organization. So that person, I can teach them how to begin to build relationships with their peers, how to manage up, how to manage down, how to really move beyond their department and be the best that they can be. The second type of client that is, is totally uh, fits my wheelhouse is that person who is an entrepreneur. They can be a person who has started a business or a person that's been in business for a while and they want to get better. They have a team of people that work with them and they're saying, you know what, we want to grow this business. And that age range can go anywhere from 25 to 50. Uh, because I can speak to them on many different levels. And so th those are typically our clients that we work with. And obviously we work with big box brands who bring us in to do specific things uh, for their company as it relates to change, leadership, customer experience. And it's, it's so interesting that these relationship building tactics and, you know, across colleagues and managing up and down, nobody teaches anyone how to do that. And no, they don't. <laughs> and, and that little bit of extra insight, that coaching can make such an exponential difference in someone's career trajectory if they take the time to learn those skills. Totally. Absolutely. Totally believe that. And I believe what's allowed us to have sustainability over 15 years is this one simple phrase, relationships are the currency of the future. How you handle relationships is everything. And they don't teach that in B school, uh, but it is everything that you need to succeed long term. Now, building on that, what would you say are the top two or three skills that are necessary for success in today's world? Well, there are three. Number one, sense making, design mindset, and novel or adaptive thinking. So let me unpack both of these. When I talk about sense making, it's being able to take information that's scattered and pull it all together and see the big picture and articulate. So those who are listening to us right now probably remember putting together a puzzle growing up. And you remember when you were putting the puzzle, all the pieces were scattered. But the moment you turned the box over and you saw the big picture, you could pull all the pieces together. Well, sense making is if I receive information from X, how do I take information from Y and put the piece together? Critically important. Design mindset is understanding that visuals are processed 60,000 times faster than anything. So if you walk into the Apple store, the Apple store is really the epitome of design mindset, minimalist, wide aisles, white spaces, that's design mindset. So when you think about your website, when you think about anything you do, what is design thinking that goes into that? And then finally, novel or adaptive thinking is dealing with change. We are now in what many will call a VUCA environment. VUCA is an acronym that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So in that environment, how do I change my thinking and not hold on to the way things have always been done? So for example, if you think about the first iPhone came out, what, in 2007? Mm -hmm. But how many generations of phones have we been introduced to since 2007? So this whole thing of novel and adaptive thinking is how am I upgrading my generation, upgrading my change, upgrading my thinking so that I can be relevant in every economy? I love those. Those are some incredible skill sets uh, that are, you know, I've asked that question to over two dozen, three dozen people now, and I, I have to say those are probably some of my top answers because they're not the, you know, nothing about that was a generic statement, and I really like how you were able to unpack them for us. Now, you touched on, you know, as we're implementing and going through these different things, have you noticed a big shift in the conversational differences between different generations? Uh, like millennials and Gen X and baby boomers? And how have you worked with some of your clients to maybe bridge those gaps between the, the, 
the generations in terms of workplace communication? Yeah, so most people come into a corporation or a business as a cheetah, but over time become a hippo. Now, what do I mean by this? A cheetah, swiftest hunter in Africa, a cheetah can reach up to 70 miles per hour in just a few strides. A cheetah has dark tear marks, so when it's in pursuit of its prey, it stalks its prey, and the pouncing goes from zero to 20 seconds. A hippo, lazy, ornery, this is the way we've always done it. We're not changing. They know where the bodies are buried. They know where the landmines are, and this is the way it's going to be. So then the question becomes, what happens when you put a cheetah with a hippo? You get a cheapo, but that's beside the point. (laughs) That's beside the point. Here's the whole takeaway. Every cheetah needs a hippo, and every hippo needs a cheetah to create an equilibrium in any business environment. So what that looks like is, and cheetah and hippo has nothing to do with tenure. It has everything to do with the mindset. So a cheetah wants to be promoted, wants to succeed, wants to advance the company. But the hippo has been there, done that. So the cheetah needs to rub off on the hippo to unlock that in a Madagascar so they can move it, move it, get to it. But then the hippo needs to teach the cheetah the policies and the culture and the things of, or what I should call the rules of engagement that are not written down. How do you understand the nuances of the culture to get done what needs to get done. So you really need each other. The other thing is, I was just with a group of automotive executives over the weekend, and I made this statement. I said, you know, there are people out saying, millennials this, millennials that, they're so special. I said, here's the deal. Millennials are no different than when you were their age. You wanted the same thing. So why put them and lump them into this label as if they're special and there's some anomaly or outlier? Are you kidding me? You were just like them. So get over it. Just deal with it. And I believe that millennials and Xers and boomers can all work together if we just approach it from that mindset. Because research says that there are 75 million millennials in the workforce right now. And I think if we just stop putting them, you know, on a pedestal and saying that they're so special and recognize, guess what? They have value to bring. And you were just like them when you were their age. I totally agree. And I think, you know, so many people or so many companies that we've, we've worked with or we've talked to, they don't figure out how to capture those differences and then build upon them to create a cohesive environment. And I think totally. that's where, you know, that's where someone like you comes into play and, and is such a success for that business on the other side. Mm-hmm. Totally. Now, one of your, a few of your blog posts I was reading about talk about how overcoming rejection and, yes. you know, especially, you know, as a cheetah in today's world and you want to run, run through everything, you want to make those, uh, those big leaps and goals throughout your career. And, when you hit that wall, how are some of the ways that you're able to cope and and get around that so you can put yourself back together and get in the game? Well, first of all, whenever you experience rejection, reframe it by understanding rejection is a gift. And here are three ways to see it. Number one, rejection comes to invite you to a higher viewing point to grow and to develop, to be your best self. So you've often heard the cliche phrase, you know, it's just business, don't take it personal, right? And it's really true because when you internalize it, the internalization of rejection has an emotion attached to it and the emotion impacts you mentally. Let me say it to you a different way. Research says when the brain is worried because of change or or something didn't go your way, the brain slows down. So literally, you almost put yourself in neutral because the rejection has been internalized and you're constantly turning the story over in your head as to what happened. So here's the next thing. It happened. Don't build a whole story around the rejection because the story that you build around the rejection becomes bigger than what happened. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Then the third thing is say, okay, How do I learn, unlearn, and relearn as a result of the rejection? So I'll give you an example. I've been working on a client for years to to, to try to do business with them 
and they rejected me year after year after year. So I decided, wait a minute, I need to go and hire a coach because there's something missing in my skill set that's preventing me from getting the green light of go. Sure enough, worked with a coach over many months and came back to the client and the client says, you're ready and we're going to accept you. And they moved me to the top of the pile. What I recognize is it's not as if what I was offering them wasn't good, it wasn't great. And there were other people that were great. And if I were in their shoes, I would have done business with them as well. So I recognized I had to go and become great because good is the enemy of great. So when you think about rejection, put it into context and say, how do I realize that failure is not final? Failure is only feedback. And feedback is the breakfast of champions. Oh, wow. That's like just the way that you unpack that and put it back together, it makes it, you know, it's a stumbling step. It's something to put yourself back together. And when you reframe it and give people the steps to do so, that's where you really see the breakthroughs. Because I think most people say, you know, get over rejection or, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal. But what you just did in two minutes to unpack it, give them the action steps and then give them what to work for is such a different approach than when we speak to so many people about, oh, you just do this or you just do that. And I think the, what, one of the things I loved through reading your blog post was how you really break things down to such a granular level that there's no excuse not to take action. Exactly, exactly. Now, one of the other, what, speaking of your blog post, one of the other posts I really liked was talking about your QE factor and the importance of someone's environment. Could you shed a little light on that for us? Yeah, so QE means you're qualified to be exceptional. That's just something I absolutely believe. And the environment that you put yourself in determines how you think, what you see, what you say, what you feel, and ultimately what you produce with your life. So sometimes you can have an individual who's qualified to be exceptional and they are 50 by 60 in their thinking, but they're associating with people that have an eight by 10 worldview. So either you're going to shrink down or they're going to rise up to where you are. So the environment is critically important. Here are three takeaways. Number one, whoever has your ear has your life. You can tell where you are going by the conversations that you are in and the people you associate with. So if you want, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, okay? So environment. The second thing to think about is leaders are readers and readers are leaders. You've often heard that. Tony Robbins has said that. What are the books that you are reading right now? So I'll give you an example. I'm getting ready to give a TEDx talk in a couple of days, and I decided to go and pick up a copy of TED Talks. I have like thumbed through this. I have like dog-eared it. I have underlined it. I'm like, okay, I got 18 minutes to speak to the world. And if I don't hit it, I'm toast, right? So I have created an environment to say, what is it that Chris Anderson, the founder of TED, what is it that he knows that I should know? Creating an environment for myself. And then the other thing is, I believe that the environment called podcasts, the world of podcasting is incredible. How do I immerse myself and listen to some of the best podcasts like this one? But how, how do I continue to feed myself on, on podcasts that help me grow and create a new mental zip code for me to begin to transfer from where I am to where I want to go? And I think it's brilliant that you brought up the fact through reading in podcasts, so many people limit themselves in their physical proximity of, you know, I, d I don't have a CEO or these, these big important people around me. I just have the couple of coworkers, but through books and, and reading and learning and going to events and conferences, you can expand your mind in so many ways, drastically change the way you're thinking. And I think that's how you really change the world. Totally. Gotcha. Now, speaking of books, do you, I know that you have a recent book, Shift Your Brilliance, and you are also the author of, I believe, seven other books. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, of all of your books, where would you recommend someone start if they're going to go through the Simon Bailey bibliography? 
Wow. So I would probably encourage them to start with release your brilliance because release your brilliance is the foundation of all the other books that I've written and really has been the catalyst behind my work. You know, I position myself as the leader of the brilliance movement. So let me tell you why. When I first wrote the book, Release Your Brilliance, I based it on some of the research work of Dr. Howard Gardner, who is professor of education at Harvard. Dr. Gardner, he and his team of researchers did an interesting study over a 20 plus year period. And what they discovered is that children up until the age of four are operating at the genius level. The same group of children were studied in their early 20s and only 10% were still operating at the genius level. And in their late 20s, early 30s, only 2%. So the question you have, like I had, is where did this genius or brilliance go? It didn't go anywhere, but it became buried by a society that says, color within the lines, sit down, give it back, you can't do that. And the more you continue to hear what you can't do, where you can't go, and who you can't become, there's a neurological path that is creating the brain that causes individuals to shut down. So people have this potential, this insight, this genius, but they show up in a place called work or they show up in an environment that doesn't get them. So in Release Your Brilliance, I teach you that you have four specific keys to transform and reveal your genius to the world. Oh, I'm excited. I'm gonna have to add that to the top of the reading list now. Now, your most recent book, Shift Your Brilliance, you also have a training program that comes along with that? Yeah, we have an entire system that after I wrote the book, what I, clearly realized is we needed to equip people with seven ways to take control of their life. So that's what the system is. Very nice. And so how can someone find out a little bit more about, you know, that book, the program, or even more about you? They can just go to simontbailey.com. All of our information is right there. They can click on our training programs. They'll see the Shift Your Brilliant system and get everything right there. Excellent. Excellent. Now, a couple personal questions. Oh, before I get to those, I have one more. What, what is coming up? What's upcoming in the Simon Bailey world here? Oh my goodness. All right. So I'm so excited. So for 15 years, people have been asking me, I want to become a better public speaker. I want to be a better presenter. How do you do it? Because I've spoken all over the world. And so in 2018, we are releasing a brilliant presenter how to impact, inspire, and influence any audience. And literally, I'm gonna teach you the nuts and bolts of how to crush it on stage, how to crush it with a presentation, how to get up in front of people and really own the room. Even if you're in a small group of 10 people, how do you influence and persuade them to close the deal? So yeah, I'm going to teach that. So really excited about that. Oh, that sounds exceptional. I'm ready. I'm going to have to join the waiting list for that one. <laughs> All right. So now let's flip over to the personal. Just a few questions on, on you. Do you have someone that you would consider a coach or a mentor during your business journey? Yes. I've had a coach for about the last decade. Her name is Jane Warlow. She's out of Thousand Oaks, California. And I believe a, a lot of who I am today is because being coached by Jane. She is the best. Exceptional. Now, do you have a favorite book or book recommendation to all the readers out there? Oh, my goodness. Yes, I do. There are so many. But I'll give you two, if I may. Uh, one is Firms of Endearment. It's written by three Babson College professors, Firms of Endearment. And it talks about businesses that will thrive in the next decade will put purpose before profit, thus becoming more profitable. Phenomenal read. My second favorite book is that I'm enjoying right now is The Untethered Soul. And it was a book that was recommended to me uh, by one of the folks on my team and a great, great read. I think his name is Michael Sinclair. And uh, it's really a great read that talks about a guy who decide to just untether himself from a lot of stuff and things and ended up finding everything. So that would be my recommendation. Awesome, awesome. So I know that those are two. You've listed another two or three during the course of the interview, so I'll make sure to list everything in the description for everyone. Um, this is always a fun one. If you could have a conversation with anyone, past, present, future, fact or fiction, who would it be? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. I would want to ask her, how did she make such a difference in the lives of the least, the last, and the lost? 
and why did she do it? That would be quite a conversation, I have a feeling. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, uh, this is the last one. Do you have any final words of wisdom, or is there anything that you wish I had asked that you'd like to share with everyone? You know what? I'll just share some final wisdom. A paycheck is given to people who show up, but opportunity is given to people who work beyond what they're paid to do. That is an exceptional piece right there. I really like that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Simon Bailey, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. You have given some incredible wisdom and insight. The way that you break everything down into twos and threes and action steps has been incredible. I know our, our listeners love when they can do that type of thing and, and hear it in, from the source. So I thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to be with us here for life, the Life Secret Sauce audience. Awesome. My pleasure. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. And that's a wrap. What did you think? Let us know your favorite tip that you learned in the comment section below. If you know someone that is working on being brilliant or needs a bit of motivation in their life, be a pal and send them this link. I know that they will appreciate it. Below, I've included links to Simon's website, his books, his programs, and more. So if there's something that we talked about during the interview and you'd like to find out a bit more about it, I've made it really easy. All of that information is below in the description box. As always, click subscribe down there in the corner so that you never miss a video and turn on your notifications so that you'll always know as soon as we upload a brand new video. Every Wednesday, we've got expert interviews just like this one, so you can learn the top tips from the pros themselves. On Monday, we've got life lessons from TV shows, and Friday, we've got personality breakdowns, difficult behaviors, the nitty gritty stuff, so there's a little bit of something for everyone. Finally, last but not least, don't forget we've got open enrollment on our course in Millennial Magnetism. Click the link in the description box below, and we will share all the details about how you can unleash your inner awesome and unleash your charismatic self in only 10 minutes a day. Until next time, ciao for now.